I went on Tucker Carlson and Greg Gutfield's Fox News show leading the neoliberal establishment to attack me for being a right-wing conspiracy theorist. But is it necessary to have new conversations? And who is it that's interested in censorship now? Is it the left or is it the right? <laughs> Hello there, you six million awakening wonders. Thanks for joining me on this voyage to truth and freedom, which will involve new alliances, new conversations, new ways for peripheral voices to attack centralized establishment authoritarian powers, which is exactly why I was appearing on Fox News and having conversations with other commentators and pundits from across the political spectrum. The controversy was stirred up by my appearance on shows like Tucker Carlson, Greg Gutfield. I spoke to Ben Shapiro, also numerous right wing commentators. You'll remember if you're my age, that right wing just used to be one of the things that a person could be and wasn't automatically associated with things like fascism and racism and all the ideas I think fundamentally we're agreed are bad ideas wherever we stand politically. So what is the agenda of the neoliberal establishment media? What do they want spoken about? What do they not want spoken about? Because let me tell you up front, what I learned from my conversations with figures from the conservative right, let's call them, is that there is a new willingness to form new new alliances in order to be able to attack centralized establishment authoritarian power, i.e. explicitly people that are conservative and right wing are willing to have a truce with and alliances with people that are really progressive. They are in fact willing to accept that the only way forward for us is to have more democratic power and autonomy in our communities and that the price for having autonomy and authority in your own community, and I mean power that's achieved democratically, is to allow other people to have their own power and authority in their own communities. However, centralised power wants, of course, a centralised, authoritative, institutionalised power to dictate what is possible and benefits from ongoing cultural conflagration. The reason I go on these various shows is in order to have conversations like this because I believe change is possible. And before I show you these clips, bear in mind that just a few short years ago, I did this at Fox News. This is private property. This bit here? Yes. Whose property is it? The building. Who's, who's the building belong to? It doesn't matter. No, it does matter. It doesn't matter. I'll just say it then. You want to get arrested? Um, we were booked on to Sean Hannity's show. Okay. And then it was cancelled. Can I come up, have a look around, maybe have a look at the studio, touch some stuff, meet some of the people from the Hannity show? Got a wig outside. Why? Because that's what we want you to do. So, here are some of the moments from the conversations I had, and I want you to ask yourself these questions and let me know in the chat and comments what you think. Do these conversations improve the chances of us forming new power structures and new systems? Who is it that seems to be benefiting from the ongoing cultural war? And let me know in the chat and the comments because I'm interested in what you think and I believe you can handle nuanced thinking. Let's have a look, first of all, at my appearance on Tucker Carlson on Fox News. In this conversation, both Tucker Carlson and I came to it knowing that we would disagree, presumably, about a lot of issues that I, broadly speaking, belong to the what you might call the cultural left, that he is a conservative person, you might say. We were surprised, in fact, about how many things we agreed upon, I suppose because we both agree with individual and community freedom. There were moments where I gently and respectfully confronted Tucker Carlson around some of the issues where I explicitly disagree with him. For example, the way he's spoken about homelessness in the past, perhaps identity issues, issues of sexuality. And I was surprised, in fact, about how little all, Tucker Carlson really cared about regulating the private life of other people. But what I would say is that what inspired me about this conversation is both Tucker Carlson and I are absolutely disenchanted with establishment power, whether it's on the left or the right, that neither of those terms mean anything anymore, that authority and government power has been co-opted by financial interest to such a degree that no one is voting for anything meaningful anymore. Have a look. These are them facts that I was going to uh, tell you about. If I may, I'm, I hope you will. I certainly shall do my best. <laughs> I wanted to do it down the barrel. Did you see that? Did you see the, presum the presumptiveness of me there, Tucker? <laughs> to turn straight ahead for my single. A single that frankly wasn't there because this is Tucker Carlson today. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get a nice little shot. I'm Mr. Brand. Thank you. Look at you, directs from the floor. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, America. <laughs> In the world of energy, you know energy that we require to do stuff, to move things about, to warm our homes. At least 100 members of Congress own fossil fuel stocks, of which 59 are Republicans and 41 are Democrats. Oh, look, the Republicans are a bit worse. 
Pharma. Of the $263 million of the pharmaceutical industry spent on lobbying in 2021, it gave 61% to the Democrat Party and 39% to the Republicans. Oh no, the Democrat Party is a bit worse. Wall Street. In 2022, commercial banks spent over $30 million lobbying Congress. 61% to the Republicans and 39% to the Democrats. Oh no, look, the Republicans are a bit worse. If you've seen any of the criticism in the neoliberal media, you might think, well, what was it about? Because these are not right-wing talking points. This is anti-establishment, anti-authoritarian, anti-financial corruption rhetoric that everyone should be interested in. So it makes me think that the voices that are attacking me are, whether unconsciously or not, supporting establishment power. Let me know in the comments, let me know in the chat. Let's see what's coming next. Nearly 20% of Congress members, 49 Democrats and 44 Republicans have been trading shares of companies in industries they are supposed to be overseeing as part of their committee assignment. Each one of these facts indicates a potential solution to the problem that it describes. Don't let members of Congress own stocks at all. Pharma, do not accept lobbying money from the pharmaceutical industry. It's a health industry. The interest should be, as the Hippocratic Oath declares, to do no harm. And get this, maybe even help people. A lot of my time spent thinking, I wish I could pull that necklace back in front. There's a pendant there and it's gone off to the, wait a minute. Oh no, it swung to the right. And if you remove the gargantuan motivation for profit, and I'm not talking about ending trade and profit and all of those kind of extremist arguments, I'm simply saying this is a behemoth. This is corporate gigantism. This is an outgrowth. This is a, a tumour. This has gone too far and it is possible to change it. And people that say it's not possible to change it are invested in it staying the same. You will notice that. In defense, military contractors have spent $2.5 billion on lobbying over the past two decades. They split their checks more or less evenly between the Democrat and Republican candidates, almost as if they've anticipated the possibility that either of those parties could get into power. Oh no, we've spent all our money on the Republican parties. What if the Democrat party get into power? Should we give them some money as well? Oh yeah, that means whoever gets in, our outcomes will be served. That's not right-wing rhetoric, except unless you feel that what right-wing means ultimately is a position that's anti-government and anti-establishment. And I know some of you do. I know that that's exactly what many of you feel. Let me know in the chat and the comments. But what I'm interested in are systems of organisation that are beneficial to the people that they purport to serve and are accessible to the people that they purport to serve. Do you not think it's possible when you see things like Uber and and all of these new tech apps that ultimately aggregate various powers, whether it's a car or a house, centralise it and allow it to be distributed, meaning things are possible now that just didn't used to be possible. Don't you think that that could be applied elsewhere to political power, that you could have systems where you vote for how utilities are run, systems where you vote for how resources are spent? Oh no, that would mean you wouldn't need people hundreds of miles away or thousands of miles away, in the case of the United States of America, that are lobbyable, biasable, corruptible, making decisions with your money when they're getting paid from elsewhere. That would be a terrible system. 180 Democrats and 149 Republicans joined forces to pass last year's record, record $839 billion National Defense Authorization Act. The Pentagon spent $14 trillion after 9-11. 55% of it went to for-profit defense contractors. Over half of the, four, of the 14 trillion spent by the Pentagon went to for-profit defense contractors. That doesn't mean that everything they do at Northrop Grumman, who I think make amazing telescopes, or Lockheed Martin, who I'm sure do incredible stuff, is nefarious, but it does mean it's worthy of an investigation, and these are facts that are significant in the way that your country is organized, in the way that your media reports on stories, and the way that all of us live our lives, because of course, those tax dollars are yours. That's your money that's being described in those enormous figures. Now, of course, at the moment, Tucker Carlson is particularly embroiled in controversy around January 6th and the revelation that his interpretation of those tapes demonstrates that there are questions to be asked around the way the situation was policed. And we're going to do a video on that tomorrow because, believe you me, the Capitol Police are getting some new funding that's pretty interesting. And it's a complicated issue and there are many, many perspectives on it. But you, I'm sure, like me, would agree that to be able to say that kind of stuff on a mainstream channel is helpful and advances the conversation and is generally, I would say, conciliatory in tone. Elsewhere in the chat, I explicitly say that I believe people should be able to identify however they want, express themselves however they want, as long as they don't hurt anyone else, obvious kind of stuff like that. And I specifically spoke to Tucker around the issue of homelessness. The only thing that I've ever seen, sir, that I would call you up on is when I've seen you talking about homelessness, and I feel that when talking about the subject of destitution, 
and people that live in poverty, that the basis for that conversation should be love, and also for all of the displaced people in the world, that the foundational principle should be love. I'm not claiming that I'm able to maintain that line when something offends me for some cultural or personal reason, but I know that this is what I aspire to. I agree with that, and I, and I, I, I feel that drug addicts living outside are used as political pawns to to destabilize society. I feel like they're not treated on purpose. The mentally ill live outside and die outside and are left to do that because it's useful for the people in power to draw attention away from their own misdeeds. And I'm angry about it, but I'm not angry at the fentanyl addict. I'm angry at the industry that's grown up around him yes. that doesn't treat any of his needs that leaves him to die alone and that becomes rich doing so. And that the politicians who posture yes. about his death when they could have prevented it and unfortunately, I get so overheated, I get so pissed that um, in many cases, I have allowed myself to sound like I'm mad at the junkie when I'm certainly not. As a sober person, I have deep empathy for, the, for anyone who's lost an addiction, particularly on the street. So there we go. Tucker Carlson, who on a personal level was extremely kind and beautiful to me, and I think he's a good person, and I don't believe that he is a negative influence in American cultural life. I believe that you have to accept that people have different perspectives on cultural issues, and if you don't, the alternative is some form of tyranny, and hopefully it's the form of tyranny that you happen to agree with, and I don't think that's the answer because it's a big old world out there, and people do human different. So I think that, broadly speaking, that was a positive conversation, and generally speaking, we need more conversations like it. And by God, I've been having them because I also went on Greg Gutfield's show, which I didn't know is the highest rated late night show in television, not Kimmel or any of those others. It's this one. So I went on there to talk about similar issues, which of course, I suppose, makes me a right wing conspiracy theorist. And like all good right wing conspiracy theorists, I went on Fox News and said this. You worried about the IQ decline? Yes, I am. And actually, I've got a series of good points to make because yeah. education is uh, fundamentally affected by poverty. Here, Greg Gutfield was talking about IQs dropping in America for the first time in, I don't know, 50 years ever, one of those things. And I used the opportunity to talk about education and the connection between education and poverty and the necessity to invest in education. Have a look. OK, so listen to this. According to Global Citizen, poverty is the main barrier to education in the United States. I want to draw your collective attention to the pandemic. I think we all understand that during the pandemic, education declined. Now, I can see that Greg's only got a one minute break, yeah. a one minute to a commercial, so I've got to wrap this I also have other panelists, Russell. Huh? I have other panelists. <laughs> oh, thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs> Now, listen, during that pandemic period, billionaires added five trillion to their fortunes. That means that, that during the pandemic, a new billionaire was created every single day while extreme poverty increased everywhere, while small businesses closed everywhere. Now, I'm going to say something on Fox News that until recently would not have been possible. As president, Donald Trump's tax cuts helped billionaires pay less taxes than the working class in 2018. For the first time in American history, the 400 wealthiest people paid a lower tax rate than any other group. Right wing fascists, come on. But check this out, Fox News viewers, because you're going to like this bit. In October 2021, Democrats scaled back plans for a crackdown on tax cheating, bowing to an aggressive lobbying campaign by the banking industry, while Joe Biden told rich donors on the campaign trail that nothing would fundamentally change if he were elected president. So like some of the great points in your monologue, you made the point that it's the two-party system itself, and in particular the manner in which it is funded, that prevents meaningful change for ordinary people. And this education problem, while the jokes you made were about the culture, Kardashians, etc. Really, education, if the state has a duty at all, it is the cultivation of young Americans, it is the protection of young Americans. This would be my point, Greg Gutfeld. Very good, very good. I belong to self-organising, anarchic, mutual support groups that help people with various addiction issues. In those groups, we say, look for the similarities and not for the differences. Do you think that might be something that's applicable in culture more broadly? That we should look for the areas where we agree with one another rather than focusing on the disagreements. Where there are disagreements, perhaps what we have to have is autonomy. You want to live a traditional lifestyle, you go for it. You want to live a progressive lifestyle, you go for it. The state 
they should be minimally involved in people's lives. Minimally might mean you need support of education, you might need military support. These are things that we can vote on. Wouldn't you prefer to be voting in systems where your politicians haven't already been co-opted? Let me know in the comments. Are you willing to allow other people to live how they want to if they allow you to live how you want to? Do you think centralised authority might benefit from continually stoking differences, creating conflict between ordinary people who have far more in common with one another than they'll ever have with the establishment and institutions that govern their lives? Do you think a better world is possible if we reach out our hand in friendship to people that we don't agree with? Or do you think we should be doubling down on differences, throwing stones, arguing and bickering? Can you imagine me having a conversation like that on MSNBC or CNN? It's experience. It's just sort of taking it all in. You are talking about me as if I'm, I'm not here and as if I'm an extraterrestrial. <laughs> Doesn't that seem like a reason to go on Fox News and discuss that stuff? Let me know in the chat. Let me know in the comments what you think. So the establishment media can do as many hit pieces on me as they want to. I'm going to continue to reach out and have conversations with people from across the political spectrum because one thing I've noticed that they believe and I don't believe is they think you're stupid. They think you can't handle nuance. They think you can't handle complicated conversations about the balance between power and duty and authority and largesse and licentiousness and morality and ethics and all of the complexity there entailed. I believe you can handle it. I believe you can handle the truth. I believe that collectively we have a greater intelligence than any aristocracy. I believe in true democracy. I believe that if we have conversations like this, we will come to peaceful conclusions that meaningfully change the trajectory of the planet. That's what I believe, that human beings are fundamentally beautiful. There's a bit of good in the worst of us and a bit of bad in the best of us. And together we can create something beautiful. But that's just what I think. Let me know what you think, because that's obviously, based on what I've just said, even more important. Let me know in the chat and the comments what you think. Turn on the notification bell and subscribe right now, because we need you to march alongside us in our valiant attempt to create new media spaces, new movements, new conversation. Without you, we are nothing. More important than any of that is that you please stay free. All right. The beginning bit of the pandemic, it was like really nice. It was about a month where it was like a free holiday. And I thought this is gonna be beautiful. That spirit didn't last that long, did it? <laughs> you won't get addicted to that. You take it in a jungle. I'm not gonna not get addicted to something because there's a toucan nearby. You should not let your children look at screens. Now I've got them, I'm like, oh, stick Netflix on and give it a f***ing Rolo, will ya? That clip was from my new special, Brandemic, only available on Locals. You can buy the special for $20 or pay $45 to get both the special and all my Locals content for one whole year. The special drops on Monday the 13th and is on pre-sale right now.